All right. Well, let's um, open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 8 together as we continue in our series through Romans 8. And we're going to be in verses 12 and 13 today. We're seeing in Romans 8 that real Christianity isn't just kind of a notch up on regular life. It's not just adding Jesus to an already decent life. It's about Jesus giving us new life with His very renewing presence in the Spirit. And this new life is greater than we may have thought. It's, we have a Father who loved us from eternity past and planned to redeem us and rescue us and restore us to Himself forever. We have a Son who loves us and gave His life for us on the cross and rose again to reign over us with goodness. And we have the Holy Spirit who loves us and dwells within us and works to lead us to kill that which is killing us, which is sin. Life in Christ is greater than we thought, but it's also harder than we thought. Because when someone becomes a Christian, perhaps they don't quite know what they're getting into, but they enter into a battle. That which they made peace with before, they're now at war against because they find out it was always at war against them anyways, which is our own self-centeredness and sin. Sin dehumanizes us, it deforms us, by making us into this same image of selfish hollowness. And sin is against us whether we think it is or not. It would prefer that we not think of it as an enemy. It would prefer that we ignore it, and that's what many Christians have done. We may tend to view sin as kind of like a a messy roommate that we over time just kind of put up with. It's annoying, but we ignore it. Uh, But sin isn't a roommate, it's a destructive enemy. It's an enemy that's, that's living in our home trying to set it on fire. So when you become a Christian, you enter into a battle with sin. Romans 8 verses 12 and 13 are here to wake us up to this battle and give us hope and help to fight. So let's read this together. We'll start back in verse 9 of chapter 8. You Christian, however are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And now our text for this morning. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This text is here to show us that we are in a battle, but it's showing us that when you become a Christian, sin is no longer your master. It is able to be seen for what it is, which is an enemy, and you are no longer a slave of sin. You are its executioner, and you get to live in light of the victory of Jesus. So Romans 8 is giving us hope and help for the fight. It equips us in four ways. It calls us to know your enemy, know your orders, know why it matters, and know how to actually fight. So let's walk through this together. First, know your enemy. Romans 8, here Paul contrasts two realms. We've been seeing this for a number of weeks if you've been with us. One realm is called the realm of the flesh, and this is where sin rules and it leads toward eternal death. The other realm is the realm of Christ and the Spirit, where the Spirit rules rather than sin, and it leads to life rather than death. And we've seen that when someone becomes a Christian, their sins are decisively forgiven. There is no condemnation for them. They're planted firmly in Christ Jesus, and they're also made alive by the Spirit and liberated from the power of sin. So to become a Christian is to permanently move from the realm of the flesh into the realm of the Spirit. The realm of condemnation for sin that we deserve is no longer part of our story. The grip of sin is no longer as, is no longer powerful over us. It's broken. But Paul has been arguing that because Christians are in the realm of the Spirit now, Christians are able to actually live differently. Christians are able to fulfill the law of love. 
by the power of the Spirit. Christians have a new mindset of the Spirit rather than of selfishness. Christians have a new destiny of life rather than death. And so now what Paul is doing in verses 12 to 13 is he's taking that reality that Christians have been transferred from one realm to another, and he's showing its practical consequences in our lives. Because we are now in this new realm, if you are a Christian, you are in this new realm of the Spirit. Because you are in this new realm, you now have a battle to fight. And verse 12 identifies the enemy. We are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So Christians have historically referred to the enemies, there's three main enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So the world is the collective values that shape us and pressure us to live in a certain kind of way. The Satan, or the devil is Satan who's set against Christ and his people with all of the demonic forces. And the flesh refers to our own sinful natures. Um, Ever since sin entered the world, we have a selfish nature. All three of these are deadly, and this text is focusing on the flesh. So what's the flesh? Well, it is the pull in our hearts, the pull in your heart toward self-centeredness, toward selfishness. It's the desire in each of us that says, and this is how we go through life in light of the flesh, that says, your life for mine. You give so I can get. You sacrifice for me. You give up things, I gain things. This is the opposite of what God is like and what Jesus does for us. Jesus came, and what is he saying at the cross? My life for yours. I give up and you gain. I give and you get. The flesh then is not others-oriented or God-oriented. It's self-oriented. The flesh is this anti-gospel impulse in us that says, me first. The flesh is, you could say, your addiction to yourself. My addiction to myself. It's what we could call our God complex. We would rather play God than submit to God. We want to be in charge. We want the solar system of the universe to orient around ourselves. And this is what's driving our deepest social problems in our culture and every culture. So Paul calls our enemy the flesh. He also refers to this as the deeds of the body. Do you see that in verse 13? What are those? This is not saying that our bodies are bad or your body is bad. It's saying that your body is used to do bad. Our flesh is our sinful nature, and this sinful self-orientation uses our physical body to express itself and get what it wants. Paul said something similar back in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. He said this, Let sin not therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, right, the members of your body, Do not use your body and present your eyes, your hands, your feet, your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. So our bodies are used as instruments for selfishness. We use our eyes to lust. We use our hands to take and to slap and to punch and to shove. We use our fingers to type damaging emails and social media posts to shame. We use our mouths to hurt and kill through shame and anger. So we have an enemy. Call it sin, call it the flesh, call it our self-centeredness. The Bible uses a lot of different language and imagery to refer to this enemy. The 17th century um, English Puritan John Owen wrote a book on these verses that we're looking at this morning, and he called it the mortification of sin. And he shows how alarming this reality is. Mortification meaning to put something to death, not just to be embarrassed. So the mortification of sin. And he said, making these observations that that our enemy is sin, he said, this means your enemy is not only upon you, but within you. That's alarming. Every single person comes into this world with an enemy inside of them. This explains so much about our world that cannot be explained in any other way. Most people think that most people are basically good. But then we read history, and we look around at the world and say something is terribly wrong that that has to be explained by more than social influence. It makes us ask, what if there is a deeper problem than what we can see in these external factors? 
Our culture right now is in the midst of a great experiment um, of following our heart's desires. Our individualistic culture says, find your deepest desires and live according to them, and it will go well for you. It will not go well for us. Because what if our deepest desires are conflicted and some of them do not actually have our best interest in mind or the best interest of others? Could this be why the most, perhaps the most individualistic culture in human history is also desperately depressed and unhappy? Is it perhaps because we don't realize that the enemy is actually inside of us, that the answer isn't to just do what's in you and find your deepest desires, but to discern what desires in you might actually be trying to kill you and not bring true flourishing to you and others and to honor God? We sin because in the moment, we think it will bring us some pleasure, which is why sin can be called a deceptive and deceitful desire. That's what the Bible says. It'll deceive us. Sin is not our friend. It's our enemy. John Owen said in that book that sin always aims at its utmost. I mentioned that before. It's really helpful to understand what's going on inside of us because what this means, if sin aims at its utmost, what this means is it always wants to mature and grow. It will start small to get a foothold and make us think this is not a big deal. It's a one-time thing and it's not even a huge issue. But it always wants to grow into its fullest expression. Every lustful thought you've had wants to become adultery. Every angry thought you've had towards someone that was not just wants to become murder. Every covetous feeling you've had wants to become theft. Sin is not on our side. Sin gets a foothold, convinces it doesn't want much, and then it gains ground. It just, it's fine as long as it can keep making first downs, and it'll go all the way until it wins. It wants to destroy us. Our own selfishness, though it looks like it's in our best interest in the moment, giving us what we want most, aims to destroy us. The message at the heart of Christianity is that Jesus loves us enough to save us from ourselves and those desires. Before someone becomes a Christian, they are ruled by the self. But to become a Christian is to have this self-rule broken for the sake of ourselves so that we can truly flourish as God made us to be. This doesn't mean when you become a Christian, you immediately stop sinning. That will happen in the the age to come after Jesus returns. It doesn't mean we stop sinning, but it does mean we start fighting. So Paul says here in verse 12 that we are no longer obligated to the flesh. What a statement. If you are a Christian, you do not owe the flesh anything. You don't have to obey it. What has it ever done good for you anyway? Have you ever sinned and now you look back and you think, totally worth it, totally worth it? This is what happens when you become a Christian. Sin moves from being your master to being your enemy. It's as if you were a prisoner of war and you were ruled by sin and selfishness, but you've been liberated. You walk out of that prison and you are able now to be the executioner of sin. It's your enemy. So second, then know your orders, know what you're supposed to do. Once you've been liberated from this enemy, well, you are in a battle with sin and you are called to kill it. This is verse 13. Put to death the deeds of the body. That is radical imagery. That is violent. The Bible calls you to a kind of violence. There is a mean streak in real Christianity against sin. Many Christians have called this in the past mortification. They mentioned that. It's putting something to death, the mortification of sin. That's what verse 13 is calling Christians to do. And this kind of language is not unique here. It's pervasive in the New Testament. So we can't say, well, Paul sometimes talked this way, like putting sin to death and this kind of radical stuff. But Jesus wants us to be gentle. He didn't take it that seriously. He kind of was a bit okay with how we are. He's just adding a bit of kindness to our lives. Jesus certainly wants us to be gentle, and so does Paul, uh, but not against sin. In fact, in order to be gentle, you have to kill your selfishness. Listen to what Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this in Matthew 5, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. He's using extreme language to make a point, right? He doesn't mean actually cut off your hand because you can still sin if you cut off your hand. But it doesn't mean, oh, well, he's, this is hyperbole so we don't have to take it seriously. No, he's using this imagery so that we do take it seriously, that we're radical against sin. And this is essentially what Jesus said when he called us to follow him. Every Christian is called to do this. This is essential for what it even means to become a Christian. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, renounce yourself, and take up your cross. And crosses in the Roman culture, in the Roman world in that time, were the instruments of execution. And criminals often had to carry the crossbeam, or carry part of their cross to the place of execution. So Jesus, even in inviting people to become Christians, is saying, take up your instrument of self-execution and follow me. Radical. You have to kill your self-rule and trust in my rule, Jesus is saying. Here's how Sinclair Ferguson summarizes what this means, to kill our sin. He said, it is the refusal to allow the eye to wander, the mind to contemplate the affections to run after anything, sorry, the mind to contemplate or the affections to run after anything which will draw us from Christ. It is the deliberate rejection of any sinful thought, suggestion, desires, aspiration, deed, circumstance, or provocation at the moment we become conscious of its existence. So this, th- there's no kind of side note here or footnote to this. Kill sin. The moment you become conscious of that desire or affection that's leading you away from Jesus, you renounce it, you kill it, you refuse to allow it to draw you from Christ. So know your enemies, know your orders. And third, know why this matters. The reason is plain in verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, here's the consequence, you will die. On the other hand, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, consequence, you will live. He's saying that the reason why you and I should not live according to the flesh, according to our selfishness, is because if we do, we will die. But if we kill sin and fight sin, we will live. The battle is of ultimate significance. This is clearly not just about physical life and physical death. Everyone's going to die, whether they fight sin or not. That's not what this is talking about. This is about eternal life and death. He's making a tight argument here. He's saying, if you don't fight sin but you just live according to your selfishness, you will go to hell. But if you do fight sin, you will be with Christ forever. Now, that may be, sound surprising or confusing even at first. Many Christians don't talk like that because it doesn't neatly fit some of their theological categories. Here's what I mean. Uh, Christians rightly believe that God accepts us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We are not accepted by God, justified, declared righteous, based upon our willingness or our our, uh, progress in killing sin. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And many Christians rightly believe that when we're in Christ, united to Jesus by faith, that is a permanent union. It is irrevocable. Christians are eternally secure. They will never be eternally lost. But then how does a verse like this fit with our categories? How can we believe that fighting sin leads to, in some sense, results in eternal life? So here here are two realities that seem in tension then. The eternal security of Christians and the necessity 
the non-optionalness of fighting sin. They are both in the New Testament. We see the eternal security of Christians in this very chapter. The whole point and tone of Romans chapter 8 is the security of Christians in Christ. It begins by saying that those who are in Christ Jesus have no condemnation. It ends by saying nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Buried in the middle is verse 30, which says that if you are a Christian, you are part of an eternal plan. God chose you. He's called you through the gospel. He declares you righteous, and He glorifies you. Beginning to end, it's His plan. You're folded into it. You are secure. But then the New Testament is also filled with statements that say, you have to fight sin or go to hell. Jesus said it. We already heard it in the Sermon on the Mount. That is what he was saying about fighting lust. He was saying, if you do not radically fight lust, you will go to hell. He says that kind of thing elsewhere. The Apostle Paul repeats this in a number of places. He says that a life that's given over to a sinful lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He says that in 1 Corinthians 6. He says that in Ephesians 5. It's exactly what he says here in verse 13. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So how do we hold these two realities together? How can our eternal security in Christ fit with the necessity of obeying Jesus and fighting sin? Well, here's two wrong ways to answer that question. The wrong ways would be to diminish or minimize or overlook or ignore or try to theologically reinterpret one of these realities. So some people will say that eternal security must not be true. They say that if you don't fight sin, you can lose your salvation. But that goes against the clear teaching of the New Testament in this very chapter. Others say that fighting sin must not actually be a necessity. They say that Paul doesn't really mean eternal life and death here. He's just saying that if we don't fight sin, we won't experience the fullness of abundant life and joy or something like this. So they would say that true believers can engage in a sinful lifestyle, not follow Jesus' Lord, maybe even abandon Jesus at some point, and they'll still be saved in the end. But this removes the warning of this very text and so many other scriptures in Jesus' own words. And this is very common in evangelical circles. So what's the answer? How do we hold eternal security together with the necessity of fighting sin? How do we believe in eternal security without negating verse 13, in other words? Well, it must be the case, and it is true, and also taught throughout the New Testament, that all those who are truly saved will fight sin. We must fight sin, and because of the Holy Spirit's presence and power in our lives, we can fight sin, and we will fight sin. Not perfectly, but truly. In other words, our commitment to fighting sin is itself evidence that God has truly saved us. Paul put it this way in Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ, Jesus Christ. In other words, eternal security is a true Christian doctrine, but it's only true because of other doctrines that are also true, like the doctrine of regeneration, which means that all those whom God forgives of their sins, justifies, declares righteous, He also gives new hearts to and transforms us, and He gives the Holy Spirit to, to renew us and transform us. And doctrines like the perseverance of the saints, which means that God Himself guarantees that he will persevere all Christians in the faith to the end. He will keep us fighting and keep us following Jesus. So all Christians will be saved in the end because all Christians will fight sin and keep following Jesus. If you don't fight sin, if you continue to reject Jesus' commands and you say, I like him as Savior but not as Lord, then it shows you aren't actually a Christian. You're not actually following him. You don't really know him. So, I'm going to pause for a moment and just make a number of statements just to help us think this through, just to hit this from a couple angles, then we'll move on. Because so often Christians haven't known how to rightly embrace the warnings like verse 13. So, I just want us to hear and embrace and celebrate 
some truths that all belong together, and when we embrace them all, they make sense of verse 13. So, five statements of theological truth in the New Testament. One, God justifies us by faith alone, but that the faith that justifies is never alone. So, this is because when God brings us to faith, He gives us a new heart, and He gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us transformation. In other words, Romans teaches in Romans 4 that God justifies the ungodly, and then Romans goes on to say, and the justified ungodly begin to kill their ungodliness. So, God justifies us by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. Second, God is the one who ensures that we stay in the battle and fight sin. He saves us. He sanctifies us. We are participants in salvation, but God is the one who sees to it that we participate and stay in the faith. Third, fighting sin is necessary and inevitable for Christians. We must fight sin. We can fight sin. We will fight sin. Fourth, Christians will fall into sin, sometimes terribly so, but they will eventually continue to fight. Thomas Goodwin put it this way, a sheep may fall into the mud, but the pig lies in it and wallows in it with delight. So, sheep can fall into sin, but you don't stay in it and wallow in it. Fifth, no one can lose their salvation, but they can demonstrate that they never had it. In 1 John, some professing Christians, um, he describes some professing Christians who had abandoned the gospel. And he says in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. That doesn't mean that we can always tell where someone is with the Lord. Some people may look like they are rejecting Jesus in sin, and yet it's a temporary struggle in their own heart, and they'll be back. Um, But it's also true, as Jesus says, you'll know people by their fruits. So, though we don't know hearts, He does want us to just have a general observation of life and recognize that Christians are those who follow Jesus. If someone is not following Jesus, we don't have any warrant to say, yeah, but they're still saved. That's not how Jesus talks. That's not how the New Testament talks. So, this is why the fight matters. It's a necessary expression and evidence and demonstration of what it means to be forgiven and accepted in Christ. Okay, so know your enemy, know your orders, know why it matters, and finally, how, know how to fight. We have to know how to actually kill our sin. No one goes into a battle without being prepared if they plan to be successful. No one goes in without knowing first how to fight. The key phrase that Paul gives here is in verse 13, by the Spirit. Do you see that? He says, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body. So, when God brings someone to faith, He forgives them of all their sins, He accepts them fully and forever in Christ, and He gives them the Holy Spirit. And now He says, and by the Spirit, kill your sin. God is for us, against our sin. He is not against us. He is for us, and He is with us. He sides with us against our own selfishness and sin. And so, this is not moralism. This is not legalism. This is relying on the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit as an accepted believer and a child of God, killing that which still remains in us. As Christians have called it, indwelling sin. It's no longer our master, but it still keeps coming in, and we are to kill it. And one of the reasons why I think we may fail at times to fight with the kind of vigilance that this text is calling us to is because we don't think that we'll actually have success. We don't think we actually can fight. But what if we knew that God Himself is for us and with us and in us for the sake of this fight? What if we knew that we have the Holy Spirit with us, the Almighty God by the Spirit with you right now to kill sin? So, in the moment of temptation, know that the Spirit is with you. Ask Him for help. Ask Him for strength. 
and by his power say no. You can. You won't always perfectly do it, but it's like in a boxing match, right? You can actually land punches. You don't need to just lay down. And even when you're hit, you don't need to be down for the whole count. By the Holy Spirit, get back up. Uh, This roommate keeps coming back in and trying to light the place on fire. Keep kicking it out. You don't have to give up and say, well, what am I going to do? You can keep kicking him out. And when we plug this into the whole story of redemption and salvation, we recognize that sin is a real enemy, but it is a defeated enemy. It has been decisively defeated through Jesus' death and resurrection. Its power is broken by the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. One day it will be completely vanquished and gone. And we're just in between these two moments where it's decisively defeated but not totally gone, and the Spirit is with us to do the job of fighting it on our way. One of the things the Spirit does to help us fight sin is to replace our self-love with love for Christ. The Spirit's role is to open the eyes of our heart, to hate our sin, to see it for what it is, and to see Jesus as a better master and a better Savior. And so one of the ways that the power of sin is broken in your life is by, even in the moments when you're not tempted to sin, by the Spirit, cultivate a love for Christ. Have a greater Savior. Love Jesus more than you love sin. Learn to cultivate a hatred for sin. So very practical. Here's seven words that I'd encourage you to memorize. It's not hard. And then consider just memorizing this and remembering it in moments of temptation because so often we can kind of just blank out and not know what to do. So here's seven words. One statement. Kill your sin and love your Savior. Every one of those words matters and is practical for helping us. Kill your sin and love your Savior. The whole statement carries gospel truth. Every single word you can meditate on in a moment of temptation by the Spirit to have power to fight sin. So let's just even think through each one. Kill. Be radical with your sins. In temptation, it's not how much can I do without committing a really big sin. It's get out of there and kill it. John Stott put it this way. He said, this is a clear-sighted recognition of evil as evil, leading to such a decisive and radical rejection of it that no imagery can do justice except putting it to death. So radical, kill it. Remember um, that you are called not to be a friend of sin, but you are an enemy of sin, and it's an enemy of you, and you can put it to death. I remember talking with one of our elders about this topic a few years ago, and he said that the Bible is calling us toward a zero-tolerance policy with sin. I like that. A zero-tolerance policy with sin. Kill your sin. You're to kill your sin, not just sin in general. It's not just like, okay, I'm, I'm excited to like defeat sin in general, abstractly. I don't like the idea of sin. No, this isn't calling us to just hate sin in general. This is calling you and I to kill our specific sins very practically in real space and time moments. In order to do this, you have to know what sins you are prone to. You have to recognize temptations in your life. Your temptations are different than mine. You are selfish differently than I am. Your specific sins and actions look differently. So you have to know yourself. Do you know yourself to know your, what is your strongest temptation right now in life? Can you, can you identify it? Do you know, there is one. There is a temptation that is strongest. There is a sin that is, has the strongest pull on your heart right now. There is a way in which you are selfish that is the most appalling and the strongest temptation for you. Do you know what that is right now? If so, that'd be one to set your targets on. What makes it harder for others to be around you? That's a way to identify your particular sins and selfishness, right? Maybe ask some people, how am I hard to be around? Could just be a personality thing, could be their problem, could be that you're being selfish in a way you hadn't seen, and you can kill it. What makes you miserable, and yet you feel like an addict toward it? Is there something in your life that you feel addicted to, but you know is making you miserable? In what ways do you think you might demonstrate having a God complex in life? Just something that you want to control, you don't want God part of it, you want to lead this part of your life on your own. What in your life is not reflecting the fruit of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit cultivates virtues of love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
gentleness, self-control. Where in your life are those absent, or is one of those clearly absent? That gives you a sense of where there's selfishness and flesh working in your heart. So learn to identify your sins, to kill your sins, and then kill your sin. This is not a call to kill yourself. This is not a call to self-repression. It's not attacking our personalities. It's not taking away our humanity. It's an a- actually a call to kill our selfishness so that our true self can flourish. God created you with dignity. He designed you. And sin has just gotten in there and messed the whole thing up and wants you to deform you into the image of itself and just hollow you out. So this is an invitation to kill what's killing you. It's an invitation to be set free, to be your truest self, and to truly flourish. If you want an extended illustration of this and just really a searching book on this, I'd commend to you C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. Um, It's an amazing story, um, fiction, where he just helps us realize in so many ways we are actually against our own happiness. And our selfishness is ridiculous if we can just kind of see where it is and what we're actually resisting with the fullness of joy in Jesus. So if you haven't read The Great Divorce, it's not very long, great uh, book. I had read it just for the first time probably three years ago, read it three times now. Um, I wanted to read a bunch of stories this morning, but no time. So you can read the whole book. Our culture says that our truest self is found by finding your deepest desires and making everyone affirm them and help you live them out. God says your truest self is found by recognizing that some of your desires are distorted and you've got to kill them. And some of your desires are God-given good desires and you need to cause those to flourish. And in order to cause those to flourish, you've got to kill your selfishness and reject them and follow Jesus. So kill your sin and love your Savior. The and there is important. We don't just kill sin and then just sit there. We replace sin and selfishness with love. Not self-love, but love for God, love for others. We kill selfishness and we cultivate love. We don't just say no to what's wrong. We say yes to what is true and yes to what is good and yes to what is beautiful. And specifically, love your Savior. He's not just the Savior. He is your Savior if you'll have Him. He's not against you. He's for you against your sin. He is a full savior from sin. He's already defeated sin at the cross, and he'll finally overthrow it when he comes again. And in the meantime, he is enabling you by the power of his spirit to defeat this real enemy. He's a conquering hero, and he loves you. He's died for you. He forgives you if you trust him for it. He does it gladly. He will keep you. He'll never forsake you, and he'll empower you by the spirit. And when you fail... He will forgive you. He will always take you back. That itself is even a power against sin, isn't it? In the midst of temptation to say to sin, even if I give in, my Savior will have me back. Therefore, I refuse to give in and leave such a Savior as that. And we also have to be careful that that kind of thought doesn't become a license to sin, right? To say, you know, I could just do this. He'll take me back. The heart that does that That's a heart that's already giving in to sin and leading away. So kill even that kind of foolish temptation in your heart. So in the trenches of temptation, which every one of us is in and will be in very quickly today and through the week in varying degrees, in the trenches, kill your sin and remember your Savior by the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for taking up our cause even against sin and making it yours. We thank you for not destroying us, but for promising to finally destroy sin so that you might fully rescue us. We thank you for the story of redemption, which is redeeming us from both the penalty and the power and the grip and the presence of sin and selfishness. We thank you that we are in this battle and that you are with us and for us and therefore we have confidence in victory. We have confidence that you're with us. We have confidence that you will help us. And so we pray for anyone here as well who is feeling particularly 
under the grip of sin. Lord, if they are not yet under your rule in Christ, we pray that you would break the power of sin by the Spirit and open their eyes to see your beauty in Jesus, forgive their sins, cause them to come to you for that, for forgiveness and freedom. And for anyone here who is feeling like a failure, for laying down too much and giving up and giving in, we pray that you would cause them this morning to have a fresh step of Holy Spirit-empowered, decisive obedience, and that you would help all of us to keep killing sin and keep remembering our Savior. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you guys want to stand?